Good morning, brethren and guests. Uh, I'm very glad that Brother Jamie normalized the idea of walking around during this pre during his presentation. Uh, so I'm going to do the same thing, uh, in part because uh, I, I love his self description of being peripatetic, which I will borrow from myself, but also so I can see the screens. So, um, just just a, a word of clarity, um, because we are uh, with a mixed audience today. Uh, for the non Masons who are in the room and who are listening. Um, done my best to structure things in such a way that hopefully this is engaging and this is informative, uh, but I will acknowledge that there may be a few things that maybe I can't make explicit uh, for the non-Masons in the room, and I think that's sort of the nature of the beast when speaking uh, in front of a mixed audience. Uh, and for the brethren in the room, uh, had to shave a little bit off the top of this, uh, but really all that means is that I'm not going to make any explicit commentary on contemporary Masonic practice, uh, and I fully trust that a combination of your experience and my suggestions will allow you to pick up what I'm putting down for you. So there we have it. <clears throat> now, one of the really revolutionary aspects of our craft now and throughout all of the Grand Lodge era is this idea of Masonic re religious universality. The notion is that even good men could find themselves divided by differences of religion. And so ever since uh, you know, 1717 rolled around, there has been this notion that it doesn't matter the name any particular brother gives to his God. It doesn't matter the face any particular brother ascribes to his God. What matters is that there's this matter of faith, right? That the brother has a faith in a supreme being, and that is the only religious litmus test for, for, for masonry. <clears throat> now, just because there's an absence of religious orthodoxy in the craft does not mean there is an absence of a religious theology, of a Masonic theology. And that is presented in our central myth. For about, there we are, for about the last century, if not longer, we have been divorced in our Masonic practice from this idea of our centralized myth. Um, now, even though we may not be familiar with what it is that I'm talking about, every Mason in the room is familiar with at least one what I'll call chapter of this myth. Um, it's already been mentioned, uh, so I'll, I'll go ahead and say it. The entire structure of the three degrees of craft masonry is hung upon this allegory of the building of King Solomon's temple, right? So what that is, is a biblical event, the building of the temple, and features biblical characters. We're talking Solomon, king of Israel, we're talking Hiram, king of Tyre, and we're talking about the chief architect, Hiram of Ith. Now, how, one might ask, can we be religiously universal and still ascribe to these biblically sourced myths? That's because that's all they are. They're biblically sourced, right? These characters, these features are come to us from a biblical tradition, but that story that unfolds over the three degrees, right? It, it's introduced the end of apprentice. It begins to blossom in the fellow craft degree. And by the end of the third degree, it has come into full bloom. And that story is found nowhere in the Bible. It is not a biblical story. It is a distinctly Masonic narrative. It is a, it is a narrative symbol, is what it is. And it, again, even though it's drawn from a biblical source, it allows us to maintain our religious universality, all right? But it is part of our Masonic theology. Now, the totality of this story, uh, it includes other biblical characters. It includes the likes of Noah. It includes the likes of Enoch. It includes the building of the Tower of Babel. But the Masonic use of each of those figures and those events is, again, not found in the Bible. The story that unfolds around those characters and places is its own Masonic myth. And the story moves forward. The story includes the likes, uh, it includes other aspects of other mystery traditions, right? It calls Pythagoras a Masonic brother. It refers to Hermes Trismegistus as a Masonic brother. It refers to Zoroaster as a Masonic brother. And what the story does is to present an unbroken chain of Masonic teaching, beginning with God, stretching all the way through a chosen brotherhood and manifesting one with the grand masters of the craft to the lodges and then filtering down to every member of those lodges. 
And this story, now I fish this out, uh, begins with, I'm not sure where to point this. Doesn't seem to be working. It worked a moment ago. Maybe I will try to turn it off and turn it back on again. And that is the extent of my technical know-how. <laughs> I can bang it too a couple times. So brothers, it doesn't seem to be advancing in the way that I would hope that it would advance. Anyway, where it begins is with Adam. <clears throat> Absolutely. There you go. And so as we, there we go. That's the fellow I was hoping, hoping to grab. Should I? <laughs> I should have hit it, shouldn't I? That's the other trick I know. Um, so as we stand on the threshold of this new millennium, and as we stand as those poised to carry the craft forward, it occurs to me that really one of the chief things we should do is reacquaint ourselves with this centralized myth. Now, I will say that elements of this myth um, are as old as any literature uh, traces of any sort of speculative craft, right? The late 1300s, early 1400s. But when this myth was first openly published in the pages of our first book of constitutions, it started with these words. There we go. Adam, our first parent, created after the image of God, the great architect of the universe, must have had the liberal sciences, particularly geometry, written on his heart. For ever since the fall, we find the principles of it in the hearts of his offspring. All right, so here's how it's presented. The idea of masonry, deemed so essential for the happiness and well-being of humankind, that the great architect, symbolizing this knowledge by the arts and sciences, like they always have been, placing them at the center of the very first man. Now, this myth, this, this traditional history, when it was printed in 1723, it came with the instruction that it was to be told every time a man was made a mason, as well as any other time that the master or wardens thought it to be prudent instruction, which means even if a mason only ever went to one communication the night he was made a mason, he would have heard the story. And if a brother made regular attendance at his lodge, he would have heard the story over and over and over and over and over. This myth was absolutely central to craft consciousness in the first century, century and a half of our Grand Lodge era. So again, I, I, forgive me if I, if I didn't finish making this point when the clicker wasn't working. Because we are standing on the threshold of this new millennium, we really need to reacquaint ourselves with this centralized myth because in many ways, it encapsulates everything that is speculative about our art. So let's talk about a few other ways in which this idea was presented, and then we'll really get into the meat of things. So here we have 1723. <clears throat> in the next edition of Constitutions, it was framed this way. The almighty architect and grand master of the universe, having created all things very good and according to geometry, last of all formed Adam after his own image, engraving on his heart the said noble sciences. He still retained great knowledge, especially in geometry. And again, Speaking to this Masonic religious universality, go home, go to your hotel room, go to your home, go to the lodge library upstairs, try to find the word geometry in the Bible somewhere. It's not in there. It's not in there at all. So even though we're going to be talking about Adam a lot today, again, we're speaking to Adam and to this myth related to Adam from this place of universality and not attached to any specific religious worldview or religious tradition. <clears throat> Okay, let's look at a few more examples. Um, we're going to look at some examples from Masonic song, because truly no conversation can be had about early Freemasonry without some examination of Masonic song, right? Singing was a regular feature in Masonic assemblies, and very often the lyrics of these songs were used for the purposes of Masonic teaching. So in 1734, one very clever fellow quipped, old grandfather Adam denied who can. A Mason was made as soon as a man. And a fig leaf apron always wore he to show his love of masonry. 1751, we have another unknown brother saying this. The earth and all heaven with jubilee rung and all the creation of masonry sung. When lo, to complete and adorn the gay ball, old Adam was made the grand master of all. And one more example uh, from a Masonic song. This next example is a little bit later than the rest. It comes to us from the 1790s, uh, but I include it for two very important reasons. One, it's awesome. And two, it was written by a brother from my town of Bennington, Vermont. But scarce had the cherubs expressed their surprise at the moment aged orbs as they shone, ere a scene more transporting was oped to the skies, which omnipotence claimed for its own. A mental existence, the image of God, appeared on the globe of the earth, dependent he prayed in the angle he trod, entered, passed, and was raised from the birth. 
there we have it. Uh, just a, a very, very small sampling of the numerous ways in which Adam was presented as the first Freemason. So now that we have hopefully established this idea of where Adam falls within our Masonic myth, what I'd like to do is take us through a few different ways in which this myth was presented in other elements of Masonic workings. <clears throat> All right, so one of the ways that we are able to chart the development of Masonic practice over time is through this thing called exposures. Now, Masonic exposure was when a fella went through the ceremonies of masonry and then ran home and wrote it all down to publish it in the open market to make some money. And those people are scoundrels, right? But we do owe them some debt because through their uh, breaking of their obligation, we're able to kind of see where we came from. <clears throat> and in 1760, one of these exposures was published. It was called Three Distinct Knocks. And in this 1760 exposure, we have this bit of catechism. The master asks, where were you first prepared to be made a Mason? And the answer given is, in my heart. And the reason why people knew the answer to that is because they are familiar with the 1760 catechism and not at all because they're speaking to any sort of contemporary Masonic practice. In my heart. <clears throat> so that should automatically perk up our ears given some of those examples related to Adam we just read. Uh, but let's give one more just in case uh, we're not clear where it is I'm going with this. This uh, comes to us from Brother Feifel de Signy, who was writing in Ireland in 1741. And when Brother de Signy was giving us his version of the traditional history, this is what he said. Adam, in his Sylvan Lodge, where the almighty architect imprinted upon the very tablets of his heart the amazing symmetry and silent harmony of geometrical proportion. With these principles, our primogenitor readily instructed his offspring, well knowing that they were absolutely essential to the discovery of the secret power of nature, into whose adamantine gates, when once entered, we are struck with admiration at the wisdom, strength, and beauty of its great creator. Now, we have this emerging complexity that we're starting to see through these examples, but let's throw one more example on top before we start to unpack the whole thing. Um, this, by the way, this bit of catechism comes to us from a Masonic manuscript. This is another way we're able to trace the development of our art. Uh, this particular manuscript is known as the Graham Manuscript and dates to about 1726, and it has this bit of catechism. How were you made a Freemason? Come on now. It, by a true and perfect lodge. What is a perfect lodge? The center of a true heart. Okay, so as these bits of catechism are in use in lodges, they're occurring at the exact same time with this idea of Adam as a Mason created in his heart is central to craft consciousness. Because again, this myth was absolutely front and center in the zeitgeist of early Freemasonry. And so the myth influenced the labor and vice versa, right? We should not ever view it as just some crazy coincidence that we're talking about Adam as a Mason prepared in his heart. And, oh, hey, by the way, Masons are also prepared in his heart, right? There is this absolute, that they're there for a reason. And let's start to unpack that. So Adam is made a Mason with the secrets of the art placed upon his heart. Okay, that's how he's prepared. The candidate for the Masonic degree is also prepared in his heart. Right? So when we have this bit of catechism, what is occurring is that we are creating parity. There's parity between Adam and the candidate because both are prepared in their hearts. In other words, a candidate for a Masonic degree is adopting the persona of a biblical character for the purposes of, of Masonic teachings. And I will say that again for all the master Masons in the room. A, a candidate for a Masonic degree is adapting the persona of a biblical character for the purposes of Masonic teaching. Right, that, that is a very complex theological uh, uh, ritualistic view when we start to do that. It's not simply a man going through an experience. It's a man adopting this role that all other Masons have adopted over time for the purposes of coming to a certain degree of Masonic light. And when we say that then, uh, with that other bit of catechism from 1726, which compares the heart to the lodge room, what it's telling us is that the only authentic place where that Masonic light can be bestowed is in the lodge room. So the lodge is the place where the light is bestowed. The light is compared to the knowledge of the heart, which brings us all back to this myth mythology related to Adam, this mythology that's presented to us within this Masonic context. So that's one of the ways that we see Adam as part of the central myth reflected in the workings of the time. Um, we're going to look at another example. <clears throat> so Another exposure we're going to talk about now, this exposure is called Masonry Dissected, and it dates to 1730. That was the date of the first publication. In it, the catechism asks this, 
what come you here to do? And the answer in 1730 was not to do my own proper will, but to subdue my passion still. Now, because we're talking about uh, Adam in Freemasonry, let's see what the brethren of the time had to say about it. A brother writing in 1735 told us that our first father, Adam, was left without excuse when he transgressed the divine command. But after his default, the passions usurped the throne of reason. Now, another brother writing a few years earlier put a finer point on this. Had it not been for that fatal apple, Adam would have remained the first Freemason. And let's give you one more example before we really start to pick this apart. Uh, This comes to us from 1734. Uh, There was this oration called the Dissertation on Masonry, which incidentally is the oldest private Masonic oration ever. Uh, And it's the oldest American Masonic oration ever. So it's, it's very important. So the Dissertation on Masonry tells us, remember the fate of that primitive Mason, who being found unworthy of the happy state he was placed in, was justly driven thence by order of the great Mason. And an angel was sent to guard the entrance against him with a sword of fire. In other words, there was an angel stationed without the door armed with the proper implement of his office to keep off all Cowans and eavesdroppers. Um, but let's really begin to unpack what we saw over those, over those suggestions. What this is, is a recontextualization uh, of a story found in the Bereshit, in, in the book of Genesis. And, and what that story is, is that Adam and Eve were just kicking it in paradise, right? It was, it was great. It was paradise. That's, that's why they call it paradise. And the only rule for remaining in paradise was, hey, don't eat of the fruit of that tree of knowledge and good and evil. You stay away from that. You're good to go. But Adam and Eve were fallible. They're human beings. So of course they ate of the fruit and they got booted out because God didn't know what other rules they might break next. So they were driven out forever and ever and ever. That's the story found in, uh, in the Bereshit, in the book of Genesis. <clears throat> And that stain remains with humankind, all right, according to Jewish tradition, according to Christian tradition, and various traditions have different ways of removing that stain. Okay, but let's see what the Masons had to say about it. So if the reason, back in 1730, if the reason for someone coming to Masonry was to learn to subdue their passions, and we have it framed that Adam's failure to subdue his passions is the reason behind what Christians known as original sin, then what that must mean is that the work of learning to subdue one's passions is a correction of that original sin. It's a way to wash away that stain that biblically we are told exists through a Masonic, uh, a, a means of Masonic teaching, right? Because again, you're not going to find Masonry referenced in the Bible at all. All right, so that's my interpretation of what's happening with this idea of learning to subdue the passions and Adam's failure to subdue his passions uh, being the original sin. Let's see what the early Mason said about it. One early Mason tells us, if I can get the clicker to work, one early Mason, I promise you, here it is. Uh, One early Mason wrote a song in 1735. It went away. Pleasure's always on thee wait. Thou reformest Adam's race. Strength and beauty in thee meet. Wisdom's radiant in thy face. So the the being referenced here is Freemasonry, right? Freemasonry reformists Adam's race. And we know this because we are told that it is being supported by the three great pillars, by wisdom, strength, and beauty. Now, this is one uh, Mason's take on it, uh, but I have have one that's even more favorite to me. Uh, This comes to us from the book M, or Masonry Triumphant, from 1736. I'll read it, then we'll start to unpack it. The world now, from west to east, from south to north, affords nothing but objects of delight and surprise. Now the mystic gate of paradise is opened, and the tree of life presents itself. And such as do not transgress the lodge's precepts will be admitted to eat the immortal fruit thereof. Okay, so let's unpack this. So by this point, 1736, there, is always, there has already been this catechetical description of the lodge room. Uh, How wide was your lodge from west to east? How long was your lodge from north to south? Right. So by using this ordinal language to describe the world, this brother is describing the lodge room itself. Right. And when the candidate is uh, brought to Masonic light, when he when he receives that Masonic light, everything he sees is laden with with layers upon layers of symbolic meaning. Right. They are he's surrounded by nothing but objects of delight and surprise. Right? He then has the potential to enter or re-enter this paradise, this paradise of the lodge room, provided that he engage in the Masonic work of learning to subdue his passions. And if he does so, if he does not transgress the lodge's precepts, he will reach immortality, 
Now, is it physical immortality? Probably not. But is it the sort of spiritual immortality that comes with engaging with this divinely sourced secret stream of teaching? Yeah, I think that's exactly what this early literature is telling us in terms of this view of, of Adam and Freemasonry and its role in this Masonic theology that remains universal. Um, one point I forgot to make when we were talking about Adam and his heart, um, we talked about the, the, the candidate for the degree adopting that persona. Um, I'm going to say this in a way that I can say this safely. Um, think about to, to contemporary Masonic practice and the manner in which the candidate for the first degree is received into the lodge room. I would propose to you that that is a tacit warning that any candidate not prepared in the manner that Adam was ought not seek admission. I would say that's where that comes from. Now, um, one, the last part of this talk has to do with um, other examples of things that resemble our traditional history. Now, remember, our traditional history is a narrative that is based in a biblical context, but is used for the purpose of other teachings, right? And there are scores and scores and scores of extra biblical, exegetical, uh, rabbinical, Kabbalistic, apocryphal tales that do the exact same thing, use these biblical contexts for the purposes of other teachings. So with the time we have, we're going to look at two examples of these that we know for sure influenced early Freemasonry. The first one is a fourth century Hebrew work known as the Arabic Katina. And the Arabic Katina has a number of stories, including this one. It is a most confessed tradition among the Eastern men that Adam was commanded by God that, the dead, that his dead body should be kept above ground till a fullness of time should come to commit it to the middle of the earth by a priest of the most high God. Therefore, as they say, this body of Adam was embalmed and transmitted from father to son till at last it was delivered up by Lamech to Noah, who appointed out the middle of the ark for a place of prayer and made it as holy as he could by the reverend presence of Adam's body. Right, fourth century Arabic Katina. In short, God told Adam he couldn't be buried until there was a priest to do so. And according to Genesis, the first priest was a fellow named Melchizedek who came about at the time of Abraham, right? So what are you going to do if you can't be buried? You're going to be passed from father to son. Of course, of course, that's how it rolls, uh, which, which means, of course, that it also has to find a place in the ark. And as the story in the Arabic Katina tells us, when it was in the ark, it served as an altar in the center of the ark itself. Now, this very story is found reference in two early Masonic works. The first one, can I get the screen back? There we go. First one is, is from a pamphlet from 1724 called The Secret History of the Freemasons, often referred to as the Briscoe Pamphlet. And it tells us this. Adam's body was safely conveyed to Noah, who placed it in the center of the ark and daily offered prayers upon this monumental tomb as an altar raised to God upon the faith of his father, Adam, right? The exact same story that we find in the Arabic Katina. And then in an even more influential work, we have the Ahiman Raison. This is the first book of constitutions for the Grand Lodge of the Ancients. And it tells us the same thing, that as soon as ever the day began to break, Noah stood up toward the body of Adam. And before the Lord, he and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah, prayed, etc. And the women answered from another part of the ark, Amen, Lord. So here we have, again, the same story from the Arabic Katina, not only Adam-centric, like literally Adam-centric, Adam is in the center of the ark, but also tapping into all those Noahite legends, which are its own talk altogether. Um, so, so here we have it. And there's one even more impressive element of this Arabic Katina story. The Arabic Katina includes the actual prayer that it says uh, Noah and his sons used aboard the ark. So according to this fourth century document, the words I'm about to say were actually uttered by Noah and his sons, the first generation Noahite. O Lord, excellent out art thou in thy truth, and there is nothing great in comparison of thee. Look upon us with the eye of mercy and compassion. Deliver us from this deluge of waters and set our feet in a larger room. By the sorrows of Adam, thy first made man, by the blood of Abel, thy holy one, by the righteousness of Seth, in whom thou art well pleased, number us not among those who have transgressed thy statutes, but take us into thy merciful care, for thou art our deliverer, and thine is the praise from all the works of thy hands forevermore. Now, in the Heman Raison, a number of this, again, the, the book of constitutions for the Grand Lodge of the Ancients, there were a number of prayers published in that book, including this prayer 
that was used at the opening of a lodge. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I am going to read the huge overlap in language. So according to Hemen Rezan, early Freemasons in lodges were saying, O Lord, excellent art thou in thy truth, and there is nothing great in comparison to thee. By the sorrows of Adam, thy first made man, by the blood of Abel, thy holy one, by the righteousness of Seth, in whom thou art well pleased, number us not among those that know not thy statutes. Right. So again, we have Masons adapting the persona of biblical characters for the purposes of Masonic teachings. In this instance, those Masons who were using this prayer were doing so in an invocational manner. They were invoking the presence of deity within their lodge by taking on the roles of the Noachites in an Adam-centric tradition. And we know that this influenced early Masonic thought in the very places it, it presented itself. Now, one more example of these early traditions. Um, there are, there is, and it's, I'll call them a family. There's a family of works in which a thing is created by God, handed to Adam, and then sent forth through the generations. <clears throat> Sometimes these are garments, you know, priestly garments, protective garments. Sometimes it's examples of various flora, you know, herbs and spices from Eden. Um, acacia actually is one, appears in one of the stories. Um, a, a, a branch from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, right? A book sometime or the thing that was passed down. And I don't know which any of those our early brethren read, but I know one they read for sure. Uh, the Wisdom of Solomon, a first century uh, apocryphal work, talks to us about the passage of wisdom personified as a she, like this, this, is the, this is the Shekinah, this is the divine Sophia being presented by God to the earth. Wisdom protected the first form father of the world when he alone had been created. She delivered him from his transgression and gave him strength to rule all things. But when an unrighteous man departed from her in his anger, he perished because in rage he slew his brother. When the earth was flooded because of him, wisdom again saved it, steering the righteous man by a paltry piece of wood. Wisdom also, when the nations in wicked agreement had been confounded, recognized the righteous man and preserved him blameless before God. So this story talks about wisdom being given to Adam, the first form father. Um, Adam's son Cain, casting aside wisdom when he killed Abel. Wisdom again saving Noah upon the paltry piece of wood. And finally, wisdom um, setting aside the righteous man when God confused the tongues of the building of the Tower of Babel. This story is the same story that is presented to us in our traditional history, in the first sort of chapter of things. All right, this is the exact same idea of this knowledge, this God, this divinely sourced, God given special knowledge given unto man and surviving as a secret stream of sacred, secret teachings throughout time. So, what does that mean for us on the threshold of this new millennium? I started to speak about it, and let me wrap up that thought. The traditional history has it, as I said, starts with God ends in the lodges. That's, that's where the knowledge is held today. And so in one manner of speaking, all the Masons in the room today are the culmination of that secret stream of teaching. We're the culmination, but we are by no point the end point of that secret stream of teaching. We have the privilege, brethren, of being only the, the, the current caretakers, the current stewards of our craft. And it is our responsibility, millennium or no millennium, it is our responsibility to therefore know our craft so we can pass forward our craft. We need to know the context. We need to know the contours. We need to know our myths. We need to know our legends and our symbols. And, and, and those, those men who have interpreted them correctly, those men who have perverted those teachings, we need to know all of that in order so we can pass it forward. In other words, what we need to do is act as Adam did, because mythically speaking, we would not have Freemasonry today if Adam chose not to teach it to his progeny. So, brethren, with that, uh, just a bit of our uh, Masonic myth and the manner in which we can create harmony through Masonic myth-making, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. If people have questions, I will take them. Yes. Orthodox 
Sure. So I thank you for this presentation because I had about like 10 pieces pop out on what I need to look at. So hey, and my pleasure. You know, in, in terms of tradition, um, Again, through your experience and my suggestion, I think you can see some the, the presence of some of these um, practices or ideas still present in lodge rooms today. And as I as I hope I was able to illustrate, many of these have some tie back to this myth related to Adam. Um, now, a tradition forgotten is not the same thing as a as a tradition extinguished. So part of what our role is in recapturing this traditional history is understanding really where these bits of our ritual come from and what that all means to us, right? So, so Masons in the 1730s knew when, they, when, when a brother was prepared in his heart, they knew automatically the connection to the central myth of Adam. We don't. And so as we reclaim this, again, not only to help define where we come from. I mean, brother, brother Jamie called us a mystery tradition. And I think this is absolutely part of that mystery tradition. This is part of what defines us as a mystery tradition, that we have this bit of sacred knowledge that we have been protecting. And once we come to terms with this myth, once we understand that these were the stories that defined the men who, who created the system that we enjoy today, that is how we can more deeply experience the craft for ourselves in ways that we haven't before. Absolutely. Uh, and again, I, I do hope that the point has been made that these were religiously universal ideas, right? The myth was created in part so that men of all faiths could engage in this conversation about deity from the same starting point, right? That, that's part of what the idea. And I would say it's no mere coincidence that at the time that religious universality was made public as a Masonic ideal, and at the same time that this myth was publicly published so that folks know what our driving uh, self-concept was, that was the exact same time that Freemasonry was exploding across the globe. Now, what the religious universality isn't the only reason for that global uh, uh, spread of Freemasonry, but it couldn't have hurt. And as we're looking to, pre to pass the craft on forward today, how do we do that? I think we go back and we see what was successful in the past. And part of what was successful was truly embracing those values of religious universality and not being afraid to talk about spiritual, metaphysical, religious ideas in a Masonic context. Yes, yes, Brother Brian. Sure. Um, and so I'm going to answer that in three ways. Uh, so to the brother who says that he disagrees with this, I say, these aren't my words. This is the words of the guys who, who wrote this. Uh, and truly, uh, for my money, the best way to figure out about early Freemasonry is to see what early Freemasons had to say about their craft. So that's how I would answer the critics within the craft, the, 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 the brethren of, of true heart who are asking those questions. And then sometimes what we have within the craft are uh, what the old guys used to call false brethren. When I say old guys, I mean early 1700s. The old, old guys would call them false brethren. Uh, Masons who denied that there was anything spiritual happening in Freemasonry. Um, yeah, there was like for, for the guys who just came, again, this, this is, these are the words of the early, Masons of the early 1700s. Masons who only came to dine who, who didn't really learn their ritual very well, who didn't really engage in the more speculative aspects of the work, they were referred to as false brethren. And in fact, the 1744 uh, from, from Brother Designe that I mentioned earlier, the full title of his work was uh, a, a, a clear and impartial inquiry into the present decay of Freemasonry in the kingdom of Ireland. And he was tying those things to the false brethren. The reason why Freemasonry was decaying in Ireland in the early 1740s, according to Brother DeSigny, was because too many brethren were coming into the craft and denying there was anything speculative about it. <laughs> 
Um, those guys are the hardest ones to argue with because if, if they are coming to the craft, if they are within the craft and have nothing but criticism for these more metaphysical outlooks, it's really hard to convince them that's like they're, they're blind. Um, Brother DeSigny also said that uh, like, I'm paraphrasing here, nothing worse than those brethren who think they can already see very well, but in fact have a haze over their visionary orbs, something like that, right? Guys who think they have it all figured out, but who in fact haven't even touched the real mystery of Freemasonry. And to the, to the anti-Masons outside of the craft, um, you're never going to convince them. Never, ever, ever are you going to convince an anti-Mason that we're a good group of guys. You're not going to do it. And so save your breath because forget those guys. Um, that may not be the most forward thinking way, but that's my approach. If, if somebody comes to me with anti Mason, if a non Mason comes to me with anti Masonic points of view, I listen, I say that's not been my experience, and I move on because you're not going to convince them otherwise. So I hope that answered your question, Brother Brian. Okay, great. Yes, hello. Okay. Sure. Um, what I what I will do is answer that from my own experience, my my own perspective, and that you know every every brother might have a, a, a different. Your, your mileage may vary. In other words, um, you know, for me, I'm reminded of another phrase that comes from the Wisdom of Solomon, that apocryphal text that I that I closed with, um, and it talks. And again, I'm going to paraphrase. Uh, it talks about how uh, the pursuit of wisdom, the labor towards wisdom, is in and of itself the devotional work. And that when one gives oneself over to that process of the labor, so our Masonic labors of subduing our passions and doing everything you just mentioned, you know, the memorization work, the contemplation of, on our symbols, the talking to well-informed brethren, that in and of itself um, can serve as the goal. And so if, is that the actual path towards subduing one's passions? I, for me, for me, it has been for sure. Am I perfect? No, no. But like, is it part of that work? Absolutely. Um, and again, I think it, because we know that our early brethren were reading texts like, like the, the wisdom of Solomon, I can't help but think that part of those thoughts uh, pervaded what we do now. The idea that the labor is worship in and of itself. Uh, and for further ideas of, in terms of um, the zodiacal and the planetary influences, I would say talk to brother Jamie and talk to brother Kirk because they know way more about it than I do. So, yeah, Brother Chris, thank you. One thing that I really I think, you know, we're trying to connect much of this to the Himalayan and, and what is tremendous for something like the Pacific Coast of them, who this may be their first time in encountering a lot of these ideas. You know, a lot of us may have wondered, so we're a bunch of 18th century Protestants trying to get a bunch of, you know, first century Christians. And, and, you know, where did all this come from? If you think that our original came from God and God. And the development of it really was cobbled together from all these sources that were common vocabulary um, among the deeper thinkers who helped us to make the transformation from modern scheduled masonry, and they were contributing to our own text. They were cobbling these ideas mm -hmm. from a lot of Hall of Fame literature that they were familiar with that is lost to us centuries, in many cases, that, that people like you and others are. Now rediscovering much of this thanks to the internet. Research like this couldn't have been done if it were not medieval research. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, the literary critic Joan Guerra would say, I want to be Hamlet, it's nothing but a bunch of famous quotations all the time. Well, sorry, Rich was much the same way when you start dissecting it. Yeah, absolutely. He said it was glorious, just for the note. Uh, that, that's the takeaway. Thank you, Brother Hodap. Thank you. All right. Well, if there's nothing else, thank you very much. Thank you again for your attention. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, everyone. Brother Caesar. Yes. The book that you mentioned earlier, uh, the decay, what was the full title of that? 
So it's by a Feifeld de Signy, and I, I want to say it's, a, oh, here it is, a serious and impartial inquiry into the de present decay of Freemasonry in the Kingdom of Ireland. Is that the same book that mentions that there were six older volumes that got together, not the four, as they formed it? I think it's in that book. That he, he that. Uh, if it is, I, I'm not familiar. It's not, not ringing a bell. Mm -hmm. Those brethren, were they the ones that left over after or during the fight between Ireland and, uh, I mean, the ancients and the moderns, did you describe those brethren? Were they possibly in that there? Well, no. So you see, you see the, the epithet false brother. Um, it actually it well predates um, the ancients' Grand Lodge. Yeah, the, I think the first, the first appearance of the term false brother is in... Um, there's a, a brother named Robert Samber who wrote a book in 1721. It was he actually translated a French work on physical immortality called Long Livers. Um, and, but he wrote this, this great introduction that essentially is like this 30 page love letter to Freemasonry. And in it, um, uh, brother Samber compares the, compares those brethren who deny any sort of, you know, spiritual or religious intent in Freemasonry to like the worst villains of the Bible. Um, you know, to Cain and to, you know, to all the baddies in the Bible, and then goes on to say that they are the false brethren. They are the false brethren. And then you see this idea used over and over and over again, really to, 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 to cement the idea that what we are doing is the magnum opus. Like this is the great work. Um, and it isn't just a supper club. Uh, fourth century. Yeah. The Arabic Katina. Yep. Great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you.